I invite you to take a Bible with me and open it back to the book of Hebrews chapter 4. Toward the end of our Bibles, back to Hebrews 4, where we will be reading together from this precious book, God's written revelation this morning. It is wonderful to be with you. Uh, Such a great group of our family here at Laurel Canyon and so many different visitors that we have with us. We appreciate your presence. It is great to be back home with you. I think I left a substantial part of my voice in uh, the heart of Alabama this past week, but it is good to be back with you, and I appreciate the words of encouragement, your prayers, your prayers for my family while I was away. It has been a busy fall for me, but it is wonderful to be home with you, Lord willing, throughout the rest of this year. We're looking forward to a good day together in God's Word, and we're going to begin reading in Hebrews chapter 4 in just a few moments. But we want to begin by talking about you and talking about me and who we are at the most fundamental of levels. You were created for God. Just four words, but words that ought to profoundly shape the way that we look at ourselves and every opportunity that we have this week. You were created for God. I was created for God. We take that a little step further. You were created to glorify God. I was created to glorify God. Created in His image, according to the very first chapter in God's written revelation to mankind. Male and female, we are created in the image of God. And there are a vast array of ways that we could appreciate what separates us as image bearers of God from other aspects of this beautiful creation around us. Would you think with me about just two of those amazing aspects this morning? As someone created in the image of God, He has given you, He has empowered me with an intellectual Faculty that, that is above the rest of creation around us. And this is really very simple to understand, but very important for each and every one of us to understand this morning. As an image bearer of God, He has blessed you with an intellectual faculty that He expects you to use. And He wants you to use that today in order to think rightly about Him. You have an intellectual faculty that separates you from the dogs and the cats and the horses and the cows around us in creation. It is God-given and you use that to glorify Him by thinking rightly about Him. Number two, created in His image, He has entrusted you, He has entrusted me with an emotional faculty that separates us from the rocks and the trees and the water throughout the oceans. An intellectual faculty that He expects us to use to glorify Him by feeling rightly about Him. Think about that most fundamental of truths this morning. We are created in His image, created to glorify Him, and we glorify Him in two ways that we're talking about this morning. By thinking rightly about Him and feeling rightly about Him. Created in His image that we might think about Him rightly and feel about Him rightly. Where are we taught to do that? 
So many of us are holding it in our hands this morning. You have your Bible open there to Hebrews chapter 4. One of many different passages from God's written revelation to mankind that shows us the power of this book that we hold in our hands this morning. Begin reading with me in verse 12 of Hebrews chapter 4 where we are very straightforwardly told that the Word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and of spirit, of joints and of marrow, and discerning the thoughts and the intentions of the heart. It is the heart that we're talking about this morning from the very beginning. The heart that God has given you. The fountain from which flow all of the different issues of life. Here we are, created in the image of God. Created to glorify Him. And He has clearly told us in His revelation to mankind, My Word is living and it is active and it impacts the most personal aspects of who you are and who I am. It gets down even into those layers of how I think and how I feel. I'm created to think rightly about God. Where do I learn to think rightly about God? Not from commentators on CNN. Not the Discovery Channel. I learn to think rightly about God based on what He has told me about Himself. I was created to feel rightly about God. Where do I learn to feel rightly about God? Not my own heart, not my own whims, not my own desires. We understand if we're honest with ourselves, that's not how it works in any relationship. I am called to treat you. You expect me to treat you not simply how I would decide to treat you, but in the way I ought to treat you. How much more so our relationship with God. Created to feel rightly about Him. What's the standard of that? It's not my heart. It's not our collective opinion. It's not what other people do in the name of God. I open His living and His active Word to learn how to feel rightly about Him. Why does that matter? Hebrews 4 and verse 13. No creature is hidden from His sight. What an awesome truth this morning. No creature is hidden from His sight, but all are naked and exposed to the eyes of Him to whom we must give account. And so there it is. Created in His image, He sees me. He sees not just what you see of me, He sees my thinking. He sees my feeling. I want to know how to shape my thinking and my feeling. I open God's Word. Let me ask you as we open our Bibles together from the book of Psalms. Open back with me to Psalm 119. Do you want to shape or do you want to maximize His shaping influence on your heart that you see? on your heart that He sees? Do you want to maximize God's shaping influence on your heart so that your thinking glorifies Him, your feeling glorifies Him? Perhaps the most profound thing you can do this week, if that's what you want, is to pray. Pray to Him. How? 
That's what we're talking about for the rest of our time together this morning. How can we pray as image bearers of God, understanding He wants me to think of Him rightly, feel about Him rightly. He teaches me to do that in His Word. How do I pray to make sure that His shaping influence is maximized on our heart? Would you think with me about six simple things we can pray this week to maximize that shaping influence? Number one, open my eyes pray this week open my eyes that I may behold wondrous things that is straight out of Psalm 119 verse 18 you might put a marker there in the Psalms we're going to come back to them again and again throughout our time together this morning Psalm 119 and verse 18 this simple but powerful prayer open my eyes that I may behold wondrous things out of your law what sort of wondrous things would you open your bible with me back to first corinthians chapter 2 and we'll take just a very short tour in first corinthians 2 that shows us what sort of wondrous things there are contained in god's revelation to mankind first corinthians chapter 2 begin reading with me in the sixth verse of the chapter where paul as he describes what he is passing along to these saints in corinth he says in verse 6 among the mature we do impart wisdom Although it is not a wisdom of this age or of the rulers of this age who are doomed to pass away. There it is again, our fundamental truth. If I want to know how to think rightly about God and feel rightly about God, I don't appeal to the wisdom of this age or the influential people of this age. I look to a higher wisdom. Verse 7, we impart a secret and a hidden wisdom of God which God decreed before the ages for our glory. None of the rulers of this age understood this. Or if they, for if they had, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. But as it is written, what no eye has seen, nor ear heard, nor the heart of man imagined what God has prepared for those who love Him. These things God has revealed to us through the Spirit, for the Spirit searches everything, even the depths of God. For who knows a person's thoughts except the spirit of that person which is in him? You can't look at me and without me saying or revealing anything, know what is going on in my heart. So also no one comprehends the thoughts of God except the Spirit of God. Here's the good news. God has provided what we need. We have received not the spirit of this world, but the spirit who is from God that we might understand. God wants me and He wants you to understand who He is and who you are and what He wants of you that you might think rightly about Him, that I might feel rightly about Him, thereby glorifying Him. He has freely given us this information he himself and now this inspired apostle says in verse 13 we impart this in words not taught by human wisdom but taught by the spirit interpreting spiritual truths to those who are spiritual let's get this out of the way a tree cannot teach you how to think rightly about God. Standing in front of the incredible Atlantic Ocean is an awesome experience and it does testify to the existence of God, but it can't teach you how to feel about God. 
you want to know how to think and to feel, you've got to open His Word. The natural person, verse 14, does not accept the things of the Spirit of God, for they are folly to him. And he is not able to understand them because they are spiritually discerned. The spiritual person judges all things. How does that man or woman do that? They are taught by God how to think, how to feel. And when I walk in the light as He is in the light, I have no reason to fear. I am not judged by anyone. For who has understood the mind of the Lord so as to instruct Him? But we have the mind of Christ. A wondrous thing. Why do you and I need to pray this week? Because for thousands of years, people have seen, but not really seen. They've heard, but not really listened. Blessed are your eyes, Jesus said to his followers nearly 2,000 years ago, because you do see. You do hear. Many prophets and righteous people longed to see what you see and did not see it and to hear what you hear and did not hear it. And so let's pray this week. Open my eyes that I may behold one wondrous things. Did you mark your Bible back there in Psalm 119? Look at verse 33, number 2. Psalm 119 and verse 33. Teach me, O Lord, the way of your statutes and I will keep it to the end. Give me understanding that I may keep your law and observe it with my whole heart. Lead me in the path of your commandments for I delight in it. Incline my heart to your testimonies and not to selfish gain. Turn my eyes from looking at worthless things and give me life in your ways. We understand what that verb incline means by looking at its, its inverse. How many people will recline this afternoon? You know what that is, to sit in that big comfy chair and to reach for that wooden handle and to pull it and suddenly now, with the greatest of ease, you are reclined. You are pointed in a backward direction. What a powerful thing to pray. Incline my heart and give me life in your ways. Would you pray this week to your Father in heaven? It may be that you know, I haven't always had the attitude that I should have about the ways of God and being taught the statutes of God. I haven't always had the resolve that I'm going to keep it to the end. At times, I haven't been interested in understanding how to think and how to feel. I haven't had the resolve to keep His law and observe it with my whole heart. I I've wanted to be led by other things and other people. I've wanted to be in the lead. And so what do I do if I know I haven't lived the right sort of life? I pray, incline my heart. God, would you take my willing heart and point it in the right direction? Would you help me to take my eyes off of things that in the grand scheme of things are worthless? Would you give me life 
in your ways. Go back with me to Psalm 86, number three. Psalm 86, we'll begin reading in the eighth verse of the chapter. Psalm 86 and verse eight. The psalmist readily confesses, praises God. There is none like you among the gods, O Lord, nor are there any works like yours. All the nations you have made shall come and worship before you, O Lord, and shall glorify your name. That's why we're here. That's why you have breath to breathe this morning. You are great and do wondrous things. You alone are God. Teach me your way, O Lord that I may walk in your truth. Unite my heart to fear your name. What a profound thing to pray on this first day of the week, going into a busy week ahead, that God in this amazing complex heart that you have given me, I have all sorts of different little streams. There are feelings, there are thinking, there, there are, are aspirations, there are goals, there is hope, there are desires, there are delights, there are affections. All of these different things inside of me that make me me and inside of you that make you you. And how easy it is on this first day of the week perhaps to have a part of me stirred but then I leave this assembly and my affections are captured by other things and my will begins flowing in a different direction tomorrow and my feelings are captivated by God dishonoring things and before you know it though I have sat in an assembly of God's people by Monday night I have wandered far away from His will would you pray God, take my feelings and my intellect and, and, and my aspirations, my goals, my delights, my desires, my emotions, and would you unite them to fear you? I want to think rightly about you. I want to feel rightly about you that I might be led in the paths of life. You go with me to Psalm 30, number 4. Psalm 30 and the 10th verse of the chapter. Such a simple and straightforward but powerful prayer. Psalm 30 and verse 10. Hear, O Lord. Hear, O I am. Hear, Jehovah, and be merciful to me. Don't you feel the need for that prayer? H having listened already, open my eyes that I may behold wondrous things. God, I, I sometimes exchange the wondrous for the worthless. Incline my heart and give me life in your ways. Sometimes I chase after life in all the wrong ways. Unite my heart to fear your name. God, sometimes I live hypocritically as if you're not there or I can fool you. Hear, O Lord, and be merciful to me. O Lord, be my helper. It's all over the Bible. Psalm 57, 1 and 2. Be merciful to me, O God. Be merciful to me, for in you my soul takes refuge. In the shadow of your wings I will take refuge till the storms of destruction pass by. I cry out to God most high, to God who fulfills His purpose for me. No matter what you are going through this morning, there is is refuge in Him. In order to be in Him, we need mercy. We need to pray like that tax collector in Jesus' parable from Luke 18, standing far off, not even willing to lift our eyes to heaven, but beating our breasts, saying, God, 
be merciful to me, a sinner. And we can pray that as Christians in full assurance of faith because we, if we are in Christ, have been reconciled to God on the basis of a new covenant brought into existence by the shed blood of Jesus Christ, wherein God is able to put His law on our minds, to write His statutes on our hearts, to be our God, that we might be His people. We can know the Lord, for they shall all know me from the least of them to the greatest, and I will be merciful are you going through a dry period in your prayers be merciful to me go back with me quickly to the book of Psalms this time Psalm 90 and the 12th verse of the chapter Psalm 90 and verse 12 Psalm 90 verse 12 so teach us to number our days would you be willing to pray that to God God help me whatever you need to do to realize my days are so very limited so that I might walk in wisdom so that I might get a heart of wisdom return O Lord how long have pity on your servants satisfy us in the morning with your steadfast love have you ever prayed that to God Psalm 63 tells us God's steadfast love is better than life here he is challenging you encouraging you making the way available that as you open his word being taught how to think how to feel making available the prayer satisfy me in the morning with your steadfast love that we may rejoice and be glad all our days how long has it been since I sought satisfaction in him that fervently. Let's end in the book of James. Go back with me to James chapter 1. James chapter 1 and we'll begin reading in verse 22. James 1 and 22 where Christians are called in crystal clear terms be doers of the word and not hearers only. God drives the point home himself don't simply hear how I would have you to think how I would have you to feel trust me in order to pray these things in order to walk in the wisdom that I have revealed, re revealed. be doers of the word and not only hearers that's the pathway to deceiving ourselves for if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer. He is like a man who looks intently at his natural face in a mirror. He looks at himself and goes away and at once forgets what he was like. Looking across this room, nobody did that this morning. Sometimes I think it's news to, to audiences that, that preachers can see this way just as surely as you can see this way. Nobody did that this morning. We look in the mirror that we might address what needs to be addressed. Verse 25, the one who looks into the perfect law, the law of liberty, and perseveres, being no hearer who forgets, but a doer who acts, he will be blessed in his doing. What a powerful thing when you open God's Word this week to pray to the God who hears, the God who can shape every aspect of who you are help me be a doer of your word in the gospel of John chapter 17 and verse 3 God's own son said this is eternal life that they know you the only true God and Jesus Christ 
whom you have sent. The great goal of what you hold in your hands this morning, the great goal of the last 30 minutes that we have spent together is that you would come to know the God of the Bible. That you would come to know Jesus Christ whom He has sent. That you might think rightly about God and feel rightly about God. God has blessed you with those faculties that you might glorify Him. And if you have never responded to Him, it is to those faculties that this good news is appealing. You were created by the God of heaven and earth. Do you believe that? Your sin separates you from that holy God. God and God alone has the answer. He sent His only begotten Son who died on a cross for your sins. In that amazing news, God is teaching us how to think and how to feel. Jesus is no longer in the grave. Evidence abounds for His resurrection. By His resurrection, He has been made both Lord and Deliverer. We will stand before Him and answer for the way we spend our time on this earth. He is the Lord. We'll answer to Him. But He's also the Deliverer. In Him, there is refuge. He's teaching us how to think and how to feel. And when people were moved in that intellectual and emotional faculty created by God, when they were moved to ask, what shall we do? They were told, repent. Turn away from sin. And be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. When they did that, over and over and over again, they went on their way rejoicing. Why? Because every aspect of who they are, who they were, was reconciled to God. The good news is, that can be you this morning. If you're willing to follow His lead. Do you need to respond to Him in any way? Can we pray with you and for you as a, a disciple of Christ even this very morning? If we can be of any help, would you let us know how by coming to the front while we stand and sing?